Don, thank you very much for joining us. Um, let's begin with an introduction of the state of Canada's Indigenous economy today. I'm very proud of Indigenous businesses and that uh, they're growing in every sector across Canada and that um, uh, and, and, and I must say in every region um, there uh, we see more and more young people starting businesses and more and more women as a matter of fact uh, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of the businesses that I'm working with and in helping to invest in uh, more than 50% are women now so it's it's really interesting I, I think that that's an important uh, element of indigenous businesses today that's excellent to hear and what are the barriers to Indigenous economic development and participation in Canada? In Canada, there's really no policies in place that support Indigenous economic development or Indigenous business development. Um, recently, a report uh, was launched here in Canada by the OECD that talks about ways to better uh, support Indigenous businesses and to link Indigenous economies to regional economies. I think there's some really good policy suggestions there that could make a huge difference in Canada on involving Indigenous people in economic development and in business development. For example, uh, the OECD report talks about uh, uh, areas such as um, uh, land. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, restrictions and in, in legislation in Canada that really limit Indigenous people using their lands for economic development. Uh, the OECD report makes some uh, suggestions in that regard. It also uh, talks about uh, supporting Indigenous capacity through building in Indigenous uh, institutions. So we are looking at Indigenous institutions that can help with uh, infrastructure, uh, to help with uh, uh, um, uh, things like um, our, a Centre of Excellence for Indigenous Lands, we, so that we could share leading practices with each other on, uh, on managing our lands, on, uh, on how we, um, uh, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, case studies on how other communities have developed their lands in a sustainable way because a lot of communities and regions and of indigenous people are working on their own and we're not really we don't have a kind of a place or a clearinghouse of that kind of uh, information on case studies and leading practices that we could share amongst each other so I think building this uh, institutional capacity in all areas, whether it's education, health, is so critical to helping us build our capacity and help us to share our leading practices and the case studies of what works and what doesn't work. And how have those barriers coincided with COVID-19 to impact Canada's Indigenous economy? During COVID, I think a lot of the uh, barriers have, uh, have uh, come to the forefront. But uh, I do want to say, though, there's some really great things also uh, that we found in, during COVID. So we have a lot of businesses, I would say 50% are doing well and 50% are struggling. The uh, half that are doing well were those communities where they are located in the, uh, right within the uh, Indigenous communities, such as grocery stores, construction companies, and um, building material suppliers, those kinds of businesses, as in mainstream, did really well during COVID. But the ones that uh, struggled uh, were those businesses that are uh, like to are able to sell goods and services to a wider area, but we uh, many indigenous communities didn't have um, good connectivity. Many didn't have proper Wi-Fi, a broadband bro uh, bandwidth to be able to provide, on provide online services. And it is mostly Indigenous communities don't, that don't have the connectivity. Uh, we're in a lot of r remote and rural areas. In the case of Indigenous communities, they're sort of the last ones on the planet to have good connectivity. And it's yeah. uh, usually a, 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 an afterthought as we're not included or we might not have the population base 
for a lot of the big company companies to come in and you know put that infrastructure in so we, we're at a real disadvantage now how do you assess the rollout of government support for the indigenous economy during covid 19. federal government has uh, provided some assistance through uh, to indigenous businesses through naca but that was only after we were able to educate them about the limitations of their mainstream programs it took a while to roll out the uh, programs for indigenous businesses and I could tell you that a lot of them have struggled immensely because of waiting and not qualifying for those programs. So we've been trying to play catch up to make sure that we can address their needs. But a lot were right on the brink of closing, if not a few have closed because the assistance didn't come fast enough. You know, we're very grateful for the supports that we have given, but we're starting from behind already. And um, oftentimes when it comes to infrastructure, of course, we have to compete with a lot of the urban centers. So uh, in, we, don't, we don't become the priority when, when we have to uh, stand in the same line as some of the larger cities in, the, in each of the provinces across the country, stand, stand in line for some infrastructure dollars. We're so behind in um, addressing the infrastructure needs of our communities when we have uh, buildings are in dire need of repair, like our public buildings in dire need of repair. Um, our roads are in dire need of repair. And I can't have, if you can think of our on reserve schools where, um, you know, the guidelines are a lot of the courses will be online and most homes don't have connectivity. Uh, most schools don't have the, the right connectivity or the ability to roll out to regular education programs. So, there's a lot of uh, things that we need to educate the government about and to make sure that, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really think it's fair for us to stand in the same line as the urban centers, you know, when it comes to infrastructure. There's a diff different need in a, that's just as important in our, the small and rural areas of Canada. Okay, what do you see as a first step to bridging Indigenous communities' infrastructure gap? When it comes to infrastructure, one of the things that we're proposing is that we have a separate Indigenous Infrastructure Institute. Uh, we know that dollars set aside for Indigenous communities in Canada has gone unspent. They don't uh, sometimes realize that to get um, building supplies to a community can only happen seasonally you know, over winter roads sometimes or that there is a need for storage uh, units for building supplies so they don't get ruined in bad weather when we're taking them to remote and rural communities. Uh, there's no understanding by mainstream about the challenges that Indigenous communities face when it comes to infrastructure. So we feel that if we had uh, our own institute that could uh, you know, knows these needs firsthand instead of having the government deliver these programs, we think we could do a way better job. And it's been proven in many areas that Indigenous people are better deliverers of government programs than the government people themselves. And it's because we have that understanding. We live in these communities, and so we know. So our hope is that we can have such an institute. And how does capital fit into this strategy? We are looking at ways to uh, uh, leverage capital. Uh, we have a, a First Nation Finance Authority that uh, can offer uh, financing at the uh, 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 through at the same rate that municipal bonds receive, and so we're looking at those kinds of measures. We're looking at maybe expanding uh, services through uh, Aboriginal financial institutions that will help with economic infrastructure. Um, so there's a uh, ways that we could look at leveraging some of the dollars that we do have and spending them more wisely because there is such a, a deficit uh, for infrastructure. But the way it's working now, it's, it's, it's just uh, not working properly. And I think that we could fix that problem uh, by working together and having an institute of our own that would be in charge of delivering those kinds of uh, resources and programming and understand the best way to do it and working in you know we there's ways we can have communities working in bulk uh, purchasing and all these different kinds of things and um, uh, i think we have a lot of solutions ourselves 
And would you say we need a national strategy for indigenous economic development in Canada post COVID-19? Absolutely. That's been a passion of mine is to have a national indigenous economic strategy for Canada that's developed by indigenous people. Since um, last December 2019, we have brought all the indigenous organizations together to talk about developing this strategy and we're working on it right now. We are in the midst of finalizing the uh, lit literature review for the uh, strategy. So m many of our calls to economic prosperity will be based on a lot of work that has been done, but we're also coming up with some new ideas. You know, looking at, you know, the world has changed post COVID. So there's some things that we need to look at in that regard. But a lot of the strategy will be about building our capacity, our institutional capacity. We need to do that. We, we need to deliver our own program because we can do it better. Uh, a lot of the uh, strategy is um, based on, um, well, four pillars. The four pillars are people, land, infrastructure, and finance. Those are the areas for the strategy that we're developing those calls for economic prosperity. They will be directed to not only the government of Canada, uh, but also to uh, corporate Canada, um, all the agencies, universities, and health organizations, as well as our own people. These calls will have um, actions that we can uh, take ourselves to uh, improve uh, Indigenous economic development. And what are some of the priority areas this strategy will focus on? Well, one of the areas um, that's in the, uh, that will be included in the strategy is the development of what we're calling Supply Nation Canada. Supply Nation is a business directory of Indigenous businesses across every sector, across every region, so that uh, uh, we can include those businesses in uh, procurement opportunities uh, right across the country. The Canadian government has uh, an objective of 5% of uh, federal government procurement uh, going to Indigenous people and the, in purchasing goods and services from Indigenous businesses but sometimes they don't know who those businesses are. So it'll be really important to have such an institution. And this institution will also help our um, businesses to ensure that they're uh, uh, procurement ready, investment ready, so that they have good uh, uh, online, uh, uh, good online presence, good websites for um, becoming involved in, in, in the sales of goods and services. Um, they'll have, uh, you know, they'll be promoted uh, all across uh, to corporate Canada, uh, to all the health organizations and hospitals, the universities and colleges, uh, all of the areas that um, are important in Canada. Many, many organizations in the past few years have developed reconciliation action plans and a lot of them talk about um, buying from Indigenous businesses but they don't know how to find them. So it's incumbent on us to develop such an institute. So we think that, that well, that's an important element of of the, the strategy and, and another element is defining who an Indigenous business is. Right now there's no one uh, definition in Canada so you know this is we're not going to have the government define it. We're going to define it as Indigenous people. We're protective of who an Indigenous business is. We want to make sure that those are real businesses that are um, run by and operated by our people. So I think that that's going to be an important part. We also think, uh, you know, another element is how important it is that, uh, as I mentioned before, um, our own institutions or indigenous centers of excellence in every field in, in terms of developing our lands, developing uh, human resources. So a lot of the strategy will, will be a revolving around that institutional capacity. If you could pitch an individual or group with the power to improve indigenous economic development in Canada, whether that be the prime minister, corporate Canada, or indigenous leaders themselves, of course, 
Uh, who would you pitch and what would you urge them to do? I think I would give the same message to all of those uh, groups, to the prime minister, to indigenous leaders, to industry. I would say that uh, right now we ha are in the uh, process of developing a national indigenous economic strategy that is uh, solution oriented, that uh, we would like to see you support the implementation of this strategy and the calls to economic prosperity contained therein and that um, we know that um, by uh, having such a, um, a strategy in place indigenous people will help drive and lead sustainable development in Canada that will benefit all Canadians.